whatever you want to call it, a worker's high, but there's a supernatural peace that passes all understanding. It's not something you work up. It's something you receive by faith. Um, I believe we've observed our Ronald walking in that peace um, with his wife being diagnosed with cancer. Uh, you and I have talked about that. I think that's the, the witness uh, that I received mostly from you as you disciple me. And I'm so fortunate to call Ronald my pastor for those that don't know. A lot of people have a hard time calling him pastor. He won't tell you that, but I'll tell you that. <laughs> but that's what you are. You're my pastor. Amen? Amen. And I'm so thankful for the anointing on your life. But let's just pray. I want God to touch you in a unique and special way and just fill you with peace. Could, could you use a little peace? Amen. Come on with it. Well, would you like for your tank to be filled with peace this morning? Amen. Amen. Let's do this. I just really feel like the Lord wants to minister peace. Amen. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we lean not to our own understanding. Yes, yes, that God, in all of our ways, Lord, whether there's sickness or financial problems or relational problems, Lord, uh, if there's fear, Lord, if there's if there's too much fantasy in our life, if it's if there's failure, God, whatever it is, your peace can cover it right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. By the blood of the Lamb. Lord, we just bring peace right now to the political uproar in our nation. We speak peace. We say, be still in the name of Jesus, Lord. And Lord, we are not basing our feelings and our thoughts and our peace on circumstances or who's in the Oval Office, Lord. Our peace is in you, Jesus. Sometimes our greatest peace is in suffering, God. And God, we ask that you just rest upon us this morning with supernatural peace. Peace, Lord. Peace, Lord. Peace, Jesus. Peace, Lord. Peace. Thank you, Lord. Well, thank you. Well, this morning, um, my name's Curtis Costley. Uh, this morning, I want us to look at the last commandment Jesus gives to his disciples on the night before his crucifixion. Many times it's called Jesus' farewell discourse. And out of the 613 Jewish commandments found in the Old Testament, the two most important, and we know these, we learn these very young in our lives. Mm -hmm. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. The first and most important commandment deals with our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. The second most important commandment deals with our relationship with each other. And I think meetings like this reiterates that. It reinforces in us how important it is that we love, learn to love each other. Mm -hmm. We do that in many ways. I think for men, the hardest way to do that is to be transparent yeah. and to open our hearts and to let our guards down, to, to let our fellow brothers into our insecurities. Yeah. But I mean, no, I believe even, and I, I, I'm not going to talk about politics at all today, but this just comes to my mind. I believe even what the world... Um, or our nation is looking for what they see in President Trump is transparency, authenticity. Amen? Now some of you might disagree with that, but you can't say the man ain't authentic, okay? So there's something that men are looking for in the, in the authenticity of other men, whether that's in their successes or their failures. Y'all looked at me funny. Tell me y'all ain't vote for Kamala, okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, am I talking in the wrong place right here? Now, I wasn't planning on saying that, but I might have needed to say that. Now, I need to warm this place. Now, just, just kidding. Vote for whoever you want to, okay? But I'm voting for transparency. And I had, I've never said that at our church. I'm not in church this morning, so I can say some things I know that we're saying. Amen. Amen. But y'all looked at me like, man, who is Trump? <laughs> so 
Jesus says that all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So simply put, just keeping it basic, all the commandments fall under these two. And that's why it was such a shock to the disciples when Jesus, at this final Passover meal with his disciples, is going to communicate something to the disciples that's going to supersede the commandment they've heard since they were a child. Jesus is about to raise the love bar. He's about to raise it to a whole new level. And this is what he says right after he has knelt down and washed the disciples' feet, right after he's dipped the bread into the wine, and he's communicated to the disciples that after I dip this bread into the wine and I hand it to the person that I hand it to, this is the person that's going to betray me. That's what's going on in the context of what's happening here. So he's done these things. Our Savior's knelt down. He's washed their dirty feet. He's pointed out who is going to betray him. And, and they're very confused. I mean, he's made it clear. I'm going to dip this into the wine. I'm going to give it to the person who's going to betray me. And they're listening to all this. And then Peter asked John, the one who's leaning on Jesus, because, you know, John was the one that Jesus loved. Poor John. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, and Peter knew better than to ask him himself. They're asking him, what does all this mean? And then Jesus clearly uh, communicates this to them. And they think that Judas, the one that is portraying all of them, but especially Jesus, Jesus, they think he's gone off to buy food for the hungry. So this is a confused bunch of guys, okay? <laughs> and so he says this, Jesus, after all this, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in a minute. So he was pretty frustrated with them, too. Yeah. But if you would, turn in your Bibles or on your phones to John 13, 34. Uh-oh. Clint? Sorry. Left the water too close. <laughs> so let's look at this in John 13, 34, and 35. Now think about this. All they've heard all their lives is do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And those are, those are honorable things. Those are things we need to continually try to live up to. But Jesus sitting there knowing at this point they really don't get this but he's speaking to us also today says a new command I give you. Yeshua the maker of the universe the word our living God a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Verse 35. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Yeah. Now I want to point out something here. This word know here in verse 35 when it says everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another is gnosko. And that's what it that's how it's pronounced in the Greek. And it means to become one with. It actually means to it's the word used by the Jewish people when a Hebrew couple, a man and a woman, would get married. It's actually the word gnosko, to know is the word used by a Hebrew man and woman for sexual intercourse. So he's saying that the world will gnosko, it will become one with me when you become one, when you're intimate with each other, when the church becomes intimate, men, women, when we become one, when we are intimate to the point that the world cannot deny that we are one. Yeah. What was Jesus' prayer in John 17? Father, I pray that they become one yeah. as we have become one. Yeah. And when our hearts are melded together with Jesus, it's when we have allowed him, and I love what uh, Marcus continues saying, we have allowed God to lavish his love upon us. Yeah, amen. And we learn to love each other with that love. When we know each other in that way, when we denosco, I truly believe God is saying, I, Jesus is saying, I've given you a new command. I mean, all this other stuff is great. Yep. Okay. Yep. But the world is going to recognize you amen. when you're in unity. 
when you are one, when you are one body, when you're flowing in the different anointings, the different giftings. And how many you know that takes deferring one to another? Amen. That takes laying down your lives one for another. It's fun to talk about until someone is better at doing something than you are. Okay, or, or they're more skilled or gifted in a certain area than you are. And Jack's back there going like this because he's the most humble man I know besides Pace. <laughs> I'm going to read this in the Living Bible, okay? Let me read this to you. He says, and so I'm giving you a new commandment to you now. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. I love this in verse 34, 35. Your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciple. Amen. Look, Jesus is saying, I'm changing the standard. Mm -hmm. In the old covenant, you could use yourself as the standard. But now the way I have loved you is the new standard. That's raising the bar quite a bit, isn't it? Amen. That's setting it up there. Look. We're always going to love people, typically, it's just our natural flow, because it's more convenient than anything else. We're going to love people the way we receive love. So, if my love language is encouraging words, my tendencies are going to be, oh man, I love you, you look good today, your hair looks good, man, your clothes look good, boy, you preach good, even if you didn't. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I mean, that's what encouraging is, you know. Thank God people tell us that sometimes, amen? Yeah, man. But you're encouraging, you build up. But if my neighbor's love language is physical touch, and they don't want anybody to tell them how good they look or how good their food is, they just want somebody to wrap their arms around them and touch them, am I really going to be loving my neighbor as I love myself? Yes, but what they need is to be held. They need to be loved on. So Jesus is going to a whole other level here. We all have different love language, uh, languages. We know what these are. Encouragement, encouraging words, receiving gifts, quality time, or physical touch. So Jesus, laying down your life is the inconvenience of doing things that don't convenience you or come natural. Does that make sense? I mean, going outside the box, getting close enough to someone to know how they feel, know what touches their emotions, know what moves them, know what helps guide them into a deeper level of discipleship. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus is doing here. I mean, he's camped out with these guys. Yeah. He's cooked a meal. He slept in different homes with them. And that's what he's doing. So Jesus had taught the disciples many things during their three years together. They've experienced many supernatural things. They have healed the sick, cast out demons, and preached his word in power. But here Jesus is saying these things are important but I'm giving you something that's more important. Yeah. This lasting new commandment I'm giving you will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Yeah. Jesus is saying it's not your speaking abilities, organizational skills, or ornate building. That's what we think it is. Amen? Right. Many times. He's saying it's your love for each other that will draw others to me. Yeah. He's saying my true followers will change the world by laying down their lives for each other. Yeah. I truly believe in this type of love for one another. Jesus is laying the foundation for the formation of a group of people called the church. Yeah. The ecclesia, the called out ones. This is something the world has never experienced before. It's never seen or heard of. Jesus is creating a group identified by two things and two things only, love for him and love for each other. Amen. Jesus is saying, and they've experienced this with the Samaritans in many different groups, but he's saying this, many groups are identified by their skin color, by their gender or their social standing, Amen. but you will know my true church by its love for one another. Jesus repeats this command in John 15. Let's look, let's look there together. John 15, chapter 15, verses 12 and 14. And let me remind you again. Jesus, at this point, when he repeats this, he says this three times in John chapter 13, 14, 15. 
He reminds them three times, I'm giving you a new commandment, now love each other. <coughs> now, he's already told them once, as Judas has got up and left to go betray him. They've gone through the meal process now. He's standing up with the disciples and he's headed to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's going to share with them one more time this. And this is what it says in John chapter 15. He said, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Guys, I mean, we could spend our whole lives studying that. I mean, we can look at the fruit of the Spirit. We can look at 1 Corinthians 13. But I really think, you know, where you measure this are those two uh, pinnacle points in Scripture. But I really believe even if you look at the fruit of the Spirit and you try to sift everything yeah. through that, Galatians 5. The spirit, you know, the fruit of the spirit is love. Everything flows. I mean, it, everything flows from this. It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience. It's kindness. It's goodness. It's faithfulness. It's gentleness mm -hmm. and it's self control. It's what we've been preaching on all week. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Clay did an awesome job on faithfulness last night. It's abiding. We want to be fruitful then we abide in the truth of the fruit. Yeah. Yeah. We measure everything we do with an individual. How did I treat, I told my son the other day, he, he, he has a relationship that he's, an um, awesome relationship with God, that God has ordained, and he, he uh, said something that the lady took wrong. Does that ever happen to you? And I didn't really know this. We would talk a little bit about it, but the Lord uh, had dealt with me that day, and he's, and was just reminding me that, you know, son, you're never going to make all the right decisions, but you've always patterned yourself to, when you make wrong decisions, to make them right as quickly as you can. Yeah. So I was sharing this with him, and how, I don't know where I was going with that. Oh, fruit. <laughs> I forget where I was going with that. So Paige, you know, recognized that he didn't communicate well to this young woman who's very special in his life. And it, he could not sleep that night. It was bothering him so bad because he knew this lady misunderstood him. She, she took something he said wrong. Yeah. So he got up the next day and he filtered that whole night through the whole process. What does love mean? What is the fruit of the Spirit? He saw wisely counsel. He got up and he made it right. Amen? Amen. That's what we do, don't we? Yeah. But let's read this. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. What's he telling them to do? To love each other the way he has loved them. Amen. Hmm. That's too simple, isn't it, guys? So I want us briefly to talk about just one aspect. I don't have seven points, 12 points, or a bunch of points. But one aspect of this time, I love points. But one aspect of this type of love that is often overlooked, I believe, and um, in this, you know, I don't know why we don't talk about this more. It's not comfortable to talk about, but I think it's something we need to address because Jesus addressed it. And it's not something that gives you loving goosebumps or makes you feel love emotionally. But it's something that we can tie into what all of our men have been sharing. And it's this, learning to put up with each other. Yeah. Learning to put up with each other. Clint, aren't you glad that people have learned to put up with us? Amen. I mean, we know Ronald has so many friends because people have learned to put up with him. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. Amen. Amen. You bear witness to that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Amen. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Amen. So I'm going to read a scripture that. Clayton shared with us last night out of John 13, and it was talking about being faithful to the end, but we're going to look at it a little differently. But John 13, verse 1 says this. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. I love this. Having loved his own who were in the world, and you said this last night, and it just burned in my spirit, he loved them to the end. When Jesus says, love each other the way I have loved you, this means loving each other to the end. It's not a shallow love. It's a deep love. It's a faithful love. You know, it's not giving up on you, love. It's hanging in there with you, 
love. It's, it's, it's sticking in there. Sometimes it's picking you up out of the miry clay mud. Sometimes it's snatching you from death. Amen? Amen. Amen? Now let's think about this. For three years, Jesus has put up with their arguing and complaining. He's put up with their mistakes and their lack of faith. And he expresses his frustration to them in Matthew chapter 17, verse 17. If you would turn there, and I'm going to read this to you, but as you turn there, let me explain to you what's going on. The disciples have been sent out to minister here. And there's a father who's come back to Jesus after the disciples have been sent out to minister. And his son is throwing himself into the water, and he's throwing himself into the fire. And he comes back to Jesus, and he says, look, your disciples have not been able to help me. He sent them out. Now, I'm, I assume as frustrated as he gets in the scripture, this is not the first time this has happened. Okay? So he says this in Matthew 17, 17. He's talking to his disciples here. You can read the context later. He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Well, okay? That's pretty, yep. pretty in your face, isn't it? Yeah, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you how long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here. <laughs> Bring the boy here. And immediately Jesus cast this demon out of the boy. And he's healed immediately. Amen. But he's talking to his disciples here. Yeah. He's loving his disciples here. He's discipling them. He's not demanding that they be perfect and know everything today. But he's also speaking the truth in love. He's being straightforward and honest. But he's also setting them up. He's setting this family up. He's remaining. The testimony is continuing that they're going to have another chance to go out yep. full of the Holy Ghost Amen. and try again. Amen. And that's what discipling is. Even if you've got to be straight with somebody. Yep. And many times we need to be straight with someone. As soon as you do that, say, get back out there. Get back in the saddle. You can do this. Yeah. If you can't come back to me and I'll help you out, I might rebuke you again, but I'm not going to throw you away. That's right. Amen? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here and he heals him. So one of the main ways we show the world that we love each other, and I know this is not what you're thinking about when you start thinking about love, but I'm telling you it's one of the deepest parts of love where the church misses it the, the most because we live in a world, if you upset me or if you disappoint me yeah. or if you let me down, I'm leaving you. Yeah. I mean, no marriage doesn't work like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, brotherhood, unity in the church does not work like That's that. Right. Okay? So one of the main ways we show the world is by learning to put up with, and it's a process. It was a process with Jesus. Yep. He had to learn to put up with the 12 disciples. Mm -hmm. And we can never allow our faults to separate us. There might be a time that we need to go in a different direction. I'm not saying there's not times like that, but most of the time, we need to overlook each other's faults because we need to be looking at our own faults. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be casting stones at others when we need to be cleaning our own life. Yes, Amen. 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 Amen? Amen. So loving to the end is the key to unity after we become Christian. Let's look at this. Colossians 3 verses 13 and 14. I want to prove this to you because this is the way Jesus operated. You know, when you hear someone talk about becoming a disciple of love, you don't expect them to say one of the keys to that is learning to put up with each other, do you? Yeah. You know? I mean, we want to, the ooshy gooshy. Yeah. I, is that a word you can use? It is now. We're not we're not at a women's conference. <laughs> hey, but the truth is, if you're a, if you're a believer, the reason you keep coming back is you want to feel the ooshy gooshy of Jesus. Kid. <laughs> you want Jesus to love on you, Amen. Yeah. That's the reason I, I I love it. But let's read this now. I just want us to think about this because. 
I know <laughs> most of us are faithful men who are, you know, involved in a local church, and 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 um, you know that's so so important. I know we can, we need to work outside the church. The Bible says, "Go into all the world and make disciples." Okay, mm -hmm. but I I think many times we misrepresent what. God's command to us is if we don't stay planted in the local church. That's just my opinion. I think I can base that up on scripture. Base that on scripture. Um, it's hard to bring forth a fruit that remains unless you're planted in the body. Now, I'm not saying you have to be within the four walls to be the body of Christ. I'm just saying don't think that there's one or the other. There's both. Don't ever get caught. The Bible says to be temperate or balanced in everything you do. Yeah. Yeah. So the mindset when it comes to a family, you know, if you look at Hebrews chapter 10, and, and, and I really believe this is the day, you know, if you're a pastor, the main thing you deal with the first year or two with people coming in is they just hurt. Mm -hmm. you got to love them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they're untrusting. They've been hurt. You don't want to hurt them. You want to love them. And the reason I believe it's like that is because God is teaching us leaders, us shepherds, whatever your anointing or your calling is, that in these last days, I believe this with all of my heart, there's going to be a supernatural outpouring of agape love into our hearts. we got to have it. Because people are hurt. I mean, read... Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Read Matthew 24. Re read how it's going to be. Read the, the birth pains. And we see all these things happening right now. And the truth is, we've got to receive more of that love so we can impart more of that love into each other. And part of that is just slap. Keep showing up and putting up with each other. It's not all that spiritual sometimes. <laughs> You know, I've been in a season this summer in my life. Uh, I got sick in June. I've never had health problems. I still don't, but I, I get really lightheaded. We've been going through some financial stuff. Many of you know what I've gone through in the last two years. And, and the Lord, the word for me right now is just keep showing up. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's right. Amen. I mean, when I was you know, praying about the peace that I wanted you to experience, it was the peace I experienced at about 7 o'clock this morning. Sometimes you have to fight for peace. Amen. 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 Right. Just keep showing up. Amen. Don't throw in the towel. Amen. You know, I'll tell you what the Lord told me with that when he said that to me. It, because it's a lot about you. Our, our fellow believers, it's more about the young people. He said, the Lord said this to me because I mean, I've thought about throwing in the towel. Have you ever thought about throwing in the towel? Oh, you? no, never. <laughs> <laughs> I've just thought about it. You know, I just ain't feeling things like I used to, you know? And when you're a love magnet like me, <laughs> it's important that people are attracted to you. Amen. Okay? You, when you're a love train like me, you got to get on the caboose and go with it. <laughs> We're going somewhere. Amen. But the truth is, I've been faithing it, faking it until I feel it. Amen. I love people. I love ministering to people. But the Lord told me that because it, 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 it wasn't for me. It was for all these young people and everybody that I'm pastor. But the Lord said, keep showing up he said, prove you're not a quitter. Come on. <laughs> well, I didn't know I had quitter in me, Jesus. But yes, I do. We all do. Yeah. Sometimes we have to overlook our own faults, Mike. Yeah. To stay in the game, you know? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's Amen. read this together. Colossians chapter 3. Make allowance for each other's faults. Yeah. Yeah. That was a ministry Jesus had to learn to thrive in to be a disciple. Mm -hmm. We expect everyone to, you know, already to have arrived. Mm -hmm. And forgive anyone who offends you. Uh -huh. yep. Yep. Listen to what it says next. Put up with each other. And remember the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. Yeah. Yeah. Now this is 
the reason we do, do this is and this is the only way you can accomplish this. Look at verse 14. I wish we had an overhead. I hope you guys are there. Colossians 3, 14. Above all, yep. the new commandment, the last thing, how I many you know it's important right before you die, your last will and testament, that what you say to somebody right before you die is the most important thing they need to remember. He said a lot, okay? Above all, clothe yourself with love. Dress yourself in love. Allow him to lavish you Amen. in love. Amen. Which does what? Binds us all together in perfect harmony and unity. Psalms 133, Old Testament, New Testament. How pleasant and how good it is when my people dwell together in unity. There I will command my blessing. Through all the, and I, and I want us to remember in closing, through all the pressure of the moment, being misunderstood, betrayed. Now Jesus is being misunderstood. They're not understanding the word. You got to understand. One of the things he says to them when they're sitting around the table, they're, they're trying, they're still wanting to see the Father. Jesus is sitting there with them. Show us the Father. He says, well, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And, and they don't get it. Now think about it. If God, First uh, John chapter 4 says what? God is love. And Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen love. Love is sitting around the table with them. They, they've eaten meals together. They've seen miracles. They've seen blind eyes open. They've seen the dead raised. They're with the perfect personification of love. And guess what? They don't get it. So we can't expect people to get it when we're discipling them when we think they're supposed to get it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not rude. <laughs> Does not envy, does not boast, not is, is not proud, not self-centered, keeps no record of the wrongs it receives, overlooks each other's faults. Yeah. And he's putting up with these guys till the end. Mm -hmm. How would you like to be love? Jesus, if you've seen the Father, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen the, the perfect personification of love. And yet you're going to the Garden of Gethsemane where you're going to sweat uh, dro drops of blood. Where you're going to lay down your suitcase, your mind, your will, your emotions before you lay down your body physically. And you just shared a meal with love. And they fall asleep on you. And I guess my point in all this is what I found as a pastor, what I found as a friend... The ones that stick together and the miracle comes in the end are the ones that learn how to receive each other right where they're at, overlook each other's faults, and filter everything through 1 Corinthians 13 and Galatians yeah. chapter 5. Amen. That needs to be the filter for your life. Take a step back. Filter it. Amen. Is that what you're clothed in? Is that what you're making every assessment in your life about? So sometimes just putting up with each other is the love that proves to the world we're his disciples. Yeah. And loving to the end is the key to unity for us Christians after we come to know the Lord. Let's just bow our heads. I was going to read you some. I am going to read you this. I'm going to close this. Take a second. This is something that part of who... I really believe this, and I believe this is prophetic, and I know it's prophetic because the Lord spoke this to me in 2018. And I've never really shared this with anybody but a few close friends in our church, but this is what the Lord spoke to me after a 10-day fast in 2018 in January, and this is what uh, you're seeing much fruit from with um, Danny and a lot of the younger. This is what they're draw drawn to, and now we have a ministry called the Love Movement, which my daughter has started. But this is where this came from, and I believe this is a word for many of you. It says, hey, he, the Lord said to me, I'm growing weary. And this is 2008 in January. And I just want to close with this just to plant this seed of how important love is. The Lord said, I'm growing weary of selfish and immature believers causing my people to stumble. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. The Lord just clearly he said, I'm growing weary of selfish and immature believers causing my people to stumble. He said, 
He said the gifts are free. And, I, and our church is 10 years old. At this point, we were four or five years old, and my main focus was speak, preaching on spiritual gifts because we have a blend of different denominations. So you have to take it pretty slow and highlight spiritual gifts. But the Lord highlighted to me, he said, the Lord said the gifts are free, but love is something you have to die for. He said, for I so loved the world that I allowed my only son to die for you. Therefore, you must give up your lives for me and each other. Yeah. This is where most of my children miss it, yeah. the each others. Mm -hmm. And he went on to tell us three things. Allow me to lavish my love upon you. We love him because he first loved us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Allow that love to melt your heart and then pour that love into each other. 1 John 4, 20, and I'm going to close by reading from the Message Bible. I don't care about offend you. It says, I'm going to read from 1 John 4, 20, 21. Just let me read it to you. Don't turn there because it'll take you forever to find it in the Message Bible. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he is a liar. My brother Kenny came over here and said, you liar. Not Kenny, but there. There. He is a liar. Mm -hmm. If he won't love the person he can't see, how can he love the God he yeah. can't see? Yeah. The command we have from Christ is blunt. Mm -hmm. Loving God includes loving people. Yeah. You've got to love them both. Yeah. Amen. 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 Go ahead, Marcus. You, you can just deserve well, Are you finished? Yes, sir. Let's let's stand for a moment. Let's just let's, let's let's just sing one worship song before we leave, Pastor. That's okay. Listen, if you need your love tank filled.